All right, we're back out. Uh, this time we're looking for some hair. We had a chance earlier, but getting the camera out and trying to get things on film, we ended up spooking it and then we couldn't track it down. So I gotta ask you, why is it that we always come out on the coldest day? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, March. Yep, middle of March. Middle of March, and we got a big cold snap, minus 20. Minus 29 this morning. Minus 29 house. this morning, yeah. And now it's what, minus 15, I think is the high. Uh, so if we can't manage to get anything fresh, we're going to be eating from uh, some of our preserves. So we have a bag of fish heads. So we're going to make some fish head soup. Everybody recommended it on the uh, Wilderness Living Challenge that we eat the fish heads and we have to eat everything. So there we go. We got uh, a bunch of trout heads from the last outing. So we're going to try to put together with some... Throw in some carrots. And I brought an onion to chop up. We have dried lechinum mushrooms that I picked in the summer. And a bag of mystery meat. So mystery from meat. From a trap line. Yeah, so you're gonna have to guess what mystery meat is. It's not a typical food. You wouldn't typically eat it as, um, you wouldn't go out and hunt it to eat it. Uh, but it is typically trapped. Yeah. So we're gonna give that a go, see how it tastes. We've also got some choke cherries. I'm gonna Try to make some patties out of that. And apples, some wild apples I've cut up. Uh, what else we got? Walnuts. Oh, some maple syrup. Oh, nice. Yeah, uh, black walnuts. So yeah, we've got a variety of things if we don't end up being successful hunting wise, which so far, not so good. Yeah. And we're also um, reblazing a trail that ends up at a secret lake that hasn't, we don't think has been fished for about a decade. But we're not sure. As yeah. far as we can tell, the trail is not very good. We've already got lost a couple times. Uh, we did some circles and we're... Yeah. I mean, this is the trail behind us. It, I don't know if it looks like much, but we're just checking the... Some of the branches are clipped here and there's a few old blazes and then there's some a lot of blowdown, yeah. so there's not much to work from. There's a good one right behind you, actually. People want to see what we're looking for as yeah. far as marks on the trees. Can show just that. This, it's still behind you. Yeah, this blaze, old axe marks. And that might look low for a blaze, but we're uh, we're just standing on uh, what four or five feet of snow. There's a lot of snow. There is a lot of snow. Anyway, let's get back at it and see what we can get. Just had a creek crossing here, and the water's not super high. Uh, or super deep, I should say. But uh, it's been warm and cold and warm and cold. So we're just making sure we don't fall through. So I got myself a little stick and we did some tests. And uh, sure enough, first, first try we went through. Not super deep, but you still don't want to get wet right now. So I just went ahead with the stick and uh, tested all the way across. And Jerry's about halfway through. So we're just continuing to go through and making sure we don't. There's a couple sections here. But again, it's not deep. I wouldn't go that way, Jerry. <laughs> oh, well, you can go that way if you want. You can go that way? I went this way. I went this way here, Jerry. Now if the water was any deeper, this isn't a big creek, but if it was any deeper we probably wouldn't be going across. What we're looking at here is we noticed walking down the trail that this tree has got a lot of condensed steam on it, which is usually signs of there's something living or burrowed or underneath there. And so it's moist breath comes up into the cold air and condenses. And in this case, it condensed on this balsam tree. So if you look in, you can see all the frost crystals that have formed. Does that show up against my glove? Probably, eh? That's a nice one. Very feathery. 
and so you would expect that there's something down there creating enough heat and moisture as a chimney. Maybe a bear, maybe a raccoon, uh, maybe a... I don't know what else. Something. So the point is, is if you're really hungry, you can start digging and maybe you'll find something like a bear or a raccoon. What do you, th what do you think about that, the size of that? Do you think it could be a bear in there? Yeah, I don't see why not. And what happens if you open it up? Is the bear gonna eat you? <laughs> maybe if it wakes up. I think it's probably pretty sleepy in there if there is one. Um, the one that that guy saw, it didn't wake up, but it was kind of stirring a little bit. But that was in much warmer weather than what we've got right now. Like today it's minus, it was minus 29 when we left and it's i don't know how cold it is now but still in the minus 20s i don't know why you ever, don't ever come up on warm days <laughs> neither do i yeah the natives did that too the natives did dig bears out of their burrows i mean people talk we talk about ethics and morals and hunting and fishing now and trapping but they would actually dig bears out of their dens while they're sleeping and they're lethargic they're not awake so they don't really put up much of a fight you just go in there and stab it and that's it it's your dinner yeah, and in some of the historical records it was interesting reading from that website you sent me where they talk about the different ways right like so some people would dispatch them with a spear other people would shoot them with the bow and arrow um, or they would club them as they emerged right so there's all kinds of interesting techniques I guess that aren't really practiced anymore yeah none of them very ethical or uh humane we would call it but that was that's that's what they lived off of so they had to do it well they didn't have to do it but i mean maybe they did have to do it who knows we don't know that we just assume that they they could have done it a better way but with the tools that they had and the techniques that they had and and their dietary needs that they didn't have much of a choice well and i think the, uh, like if you're talking about ethics you know if you have an eating ethic against a sporting ethic right so there's it's kind of a big difference. Is it unethical to kill a bear while it's asleep as opposed to awake? You know, that comes down to is it sporting or not? But sporting is not really a consideration when you're hunting for food. Ready, I'm ready. Okay. Oh, wait, do you see it? Yeah. I don't see it. I know. Oh. Still going. Oh, it's still going. It went uh, just over that little hump there. To the left? Yeah. You want to uh, follow it or do you want to circle around? How about, do you want to follow? I'll follow it and then you want to see if it comes, because they do circles, right? Okay. You want to wait for it here? See if it comes back. Okay. Or I'll go back this way a little bit. Sure. So it went. You see that the hump? That's just sunlight. Yeah. yeah. That hump light, the hump there. Yeah. And then it kept. I could see it go that way a little bit. Okay. So pick up the fresh trail. One moment nature presents an opening, and the next minute takes it away. Game of any kind is not easily taken, and it doesn't offer itself for your consumption just because you're hungry. No doubt this hare was in shooting range and Jeremy could have taken it, but trying to film the kill was too much to ask, so instead of scoring a hard-earned meal, we were left with nothing. But the hare was an additional opportunity, it wasn't our goal for this trip, we had other ideas in mind. Namely, we wanted to experiment with choke cherries to see if we could render them more palatable. As we learned on the Wilderness Living Challenge, raw choke cherries are bitter and cannot be eaten in any abundance. The seeds are also full of toxic cyanide. We were told that by crushing the berry down and then drying them, they would not only be safe to eat, but also palatable and rich in nutrients. The seeds contain both fats and proteins, a welcome addition to anyone trying to live off the land. We also aimed to sample some exotic meats given to us by a trapper. Not being a typical food item gave me some reservation. But consulting the literature proved that many natives did indeed consume its flesh, 
And when you're hungry, food is food, meat is meat. Still, we needed to find out for ourselves. We wondered, can typical fur-bearing mammals be a part of a survival feast when less typical and desirable foods like snowshoe hair were not available? Finally, we also wanted to try fish head soup once again to see if it's something our stomachs would handle. A bag full of trout would do the trick. We know that fish heads are full of fat, especially from the brain and bones, and soup by design is aimed at concentrating and collecting all the nutrients without losing them in the fire. Now we just needed to boil them and test their palatability. I really wondered if I could keep down a full portion of fish head soup. Then we'll shovel out a little bit of foot space here and shovel out some space of the fire. Rock and roll. My research has shown that natives ate more food items than most people think. While their nutrition came from big game animals such as buffalo, moose, caribou, bear, deer, and elk, they also ate marten, coyote, wolf, mink, weasel, wolverine, raccoon, fisher, and even skunk, porcupine, and chipmunks. Our daily special, the mystery meat, also made the list. Natives also ate such atypical things as loons, woodpeckers, herons, robins, jays, ravens, doves, blackbirds, chickadees, and hummingbirds. But that's just a short list. In fact, the full list is much, much longer and includes many birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, those you would not normally assume fit on any reasonable person's menu. Essentially, any animal with edible flesh was eaten so long as it would stay still long enough to be bludgeoned, speared, or pierced by arrow or other. The natives hunted and ate indiscriminately, and unlike us, did not have to obey game laws or seasons, a distinct advantage in wilderness living. In many cases, it was the whole animal that was eaten, from the nose and tongue right to the tail and hooves. Blood, intestines, organs such as heart, liver, lungs, and head and brain were all eaten from the snout right to the tail end. Some even ate antler velvet and of course the marrow from the bones rich in fat. It is far easier to make use of what you have than it is to discard less appealing portions only to start anew. In nature, waste is relative, but being wasteful is costly. It means that more work needs to be done in order to produce additional and sufficient resources. This may benefit other animals, such as scavengers, which happily feast on man's waste, but can spell disaster to any person trying to actually live off the land. Guts and grease is the root of the Native American diet. Those who couldn't or wouldn't eat these things wouldn't survive. Eating the whole animal wasn't just a trending thing to do, it was part of everyday life. It had to be done. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe as we move forward in our quest to develop our skills and knowledge about living off the land and discover the resources that are available to us. We have much more planned as we broaden our wild food palette to include an ever-increasing buffet of wild foods and fill in gaps in our understanding of the techniques used to actually survive in nature. Life is a search for energy. Eating is for the living and killing and gathering is the economy of nature. Where exactly will your next meal come from? No hair. So this is what we're eating. Fish head soup. Bag of fish heads, may smell like fish. Somehow we gotta get the gills out of these because apparently the gills aren't too good to eat. I'm gonna use this pot, but looks like Chris also planning on making rock soup. Okay. 
All right, so these are the fish heads. They were frozen. We put them into the hot soup water. And to get the gills out, this isn't how I would have done it before, but by grabbing the lower jaw and just um, pulling it, all the gills are coming off with the lower jaw. And then all the head with the brain case and that little bit of back meat are all still intact and that's going back into the soup and this is going into the fire. Smells like onions and uh, fish. And it tastes fishy. There are some of these little flat gill cover kind of bones that are, those are not gonna be eatable. Nor the jawbone with the teeth. Those are not simmered down into anything. Those flat bones, they're not disintegrating. But there's all this meat on the back. See, there's a little flat bone in there, though, too. So that's all going to be pulled out. Yeah, we might just want to strain them an eyeball. We want the eyeball and the brain in there. We just don't want the, the meat. inside of the eyeball. Yeah, bones. It doesn't smell too bad. See, that's not fun to chew on. So I think maybe if we just maybe we just want to simmer it longer, get more out of it, and then scoop all the just separate the heads. What if we crush it down? I don't know. I think you'll just get all like little tiny pieces of those flat bones. At the bottom and they're pretty gross like they're not gross but they're really unpleasant mm. well our conclusion is like based on what what we've done the uh as far as, far as the fish heads go what are we doing like are we straining it or are we oh yeah well we started picking at them to see what was eatable on them and we ended up just kind of pulling all the heads at one at a time and picking them into the soup, throwing the bones away. So, so here's a couple for example. And what we did is we checked for cheek meat and threw away, there's these big flat pieces of bone and there's a piece of back meat on the spine on the left and the right. There's the eyeball. Oh, I just lost one in there. Left and right. And then, then you're left with all kind of a mix of bones and mushy stuff that we're throwing away. Except I'll take that piece of meat out there. So, uh, so we're not going to eat, eat the whole head. No, not the not the bones. They're not really dissolving. Um, you know, maybe if we were out here all day and they was, were simmering over an all-day fire, it just reduced to mush. I once simmered a deer hip so long that it turned into mush. So I know it can happen if you simmer it long enough, but... No, I dropped a head in here, but probably I won't find it now. We'll find it when we... A, we don't want that gill in there. There's a sweet icicle here. Yeah. That choked here, mashing that up was a lot of work. But I think it turned out okay. It's going to be all stuck to that pan, which is going to be really annoying. But it wasn't not really supposed to do the fruit leather that way. You're supposed to put it out. You can put it out on a 
drying rack or whatever. This is just kind of making do with our famine foods. We got our mystery meat that you shouldn't eat. I say shouldn't eat, but it's not a typical food. A fish head soup, which I guess in some cultures is not considered famine food, but born out of famine anyway. And then our choke cherries, which was just a complete write off that uh, we couldn't make palatable in any large amount of quantity. And then we have some other things like the apples, which are a nice dessert. And then we have our syrup and uh, you know, a garden tuber, just a carrot. And then we have a squash as well. So we're not exactly in a famine situation, but making use of those items that we didn't make use before. And we'll see how this fish head soup tastes. I guess it's going to taste like really fishy fish. <laughs> <laughs> but it is trout, so we'll see if it's any better. Wash in here. Sure. And it looks tender. <laughs> you have to say it all again. It smells good. And it looks tender. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it? <laughs> what is it? Mystery meat. Mystery meat. All right, we can sit down and try it or just yeah. try it right there? Uh-huh. I think we're all in frame. Are we in frame? That's so good. Considering there's no spice, no nothing. So this is, we put nothing on this. I can't be in the frame. I don't know. All I see is the sun. Yeah, me too. Okay. It tastes like grouse to me. I would say it tastes like chicken, but it doesn't taste like chicken. Nope. It tastes like a wild bird. Mm-hmm. It's like a dark meat. Hopefully that's getting it. Yeah, I don't even think you need to put anything on there. No, I mean it wouldn't hurt. But, but it tastes good. Oh man. I move over this way, but or we move up. Move up? Yeah. Where am I? There I am. No. That's crazy. Some maple syrup from this year. Doesn't have to be that big of a mystery. Mm. People are probably in suspense now. That's good. Yep. Needs a little bit more maple syrup, but. Does it? I think so. <laughs> anyway, it's lynx. Canadian lynx. 
It's like a big domestic cat. It's just as good as a grouse. It's just as good as a cat. <laughs> yeah, now you've eaten cat. Yep. Would you eat cat again? Yep. Next we need is a coyote. Alright. Then we need dog too, cat and dog. That's good, I mm -hmm. like it. Mm -hmm. I eat it again. Mm -hmm. I need it again, even without the maple syrup. Hmm. Well, I think the thing is that it's dry enough that it's not holding together as well. You know what? The taste is good. It tastes like uh, trilopes. It's like cherries, cherries. A lot of that bitterness that we couldn't stand before is gone from it, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it tastes like black cherry. Yeah. And the little seed pits, you must have done a good job crushing them up because they're all small enough that they're manageable. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like something you shouldn't eat. Yeah, it's gonna pass through you too. Yeah. I mean, I noticed when I was doing it <clears throat> that uh, my hands were really oily and it could have been because I used sunscreen, but I don't think so. Like it was really oily, so I think it released a lot of the oils from the from the pits. Mm -hmm. But it's good. So we haven't made much of a dent. We both reached our limit. Same kind of problem with the choke cherries as before. It's just after a while, the, the bitterness kind of takes over. <laughs> that fish head soup smells like fish. fish head? <laughs> yeah. oh. I don't know how anybody likes that. Anyway, so we tried that. I was a kind of a non-starter. I think it, it, it did improve the flavor. It's almost like if you added something sweet that was actually sweet, like a berry or uh, like a blueberry or apple you'd make a better go at it, but it did It did help, and we probably got a lot more of the nutrition out of it by cracking them open. So anyway, that experiment kind of failed. Let's see if you can see this eyeball in here. You can see the eyeball in there. That looks pretty good, eh? <laughs> My soup is staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like alphagettis, but... Higher steaks. Oh, little pieces of meat. It's hot. We did add some rice. Did ever thicken up, eh? Yeah. It's worse as eating just watery fish soup. This is bound to taste better. Hmm. Did we put any salt in there? Not. No. We might need some salt. I don't think I brought any. All right, with some butter, some butter, some fat. Well, that's the head, the yeah. oils from the head and the brain, and all that good, good stuff in there. Does it taste like fish? Yep. Tastes like fish and rice and big onion. It's all right. It's not my favorite soup. Fish head soup's not your favorite soup? Well, not this one. This is not your favorite soup? No. Nope. I've made fish head soup before, but it also had rye bread and cream in it. Dill, maybe even sour cream. There's another eyeball. The middle of the eyeball is really chewy. <laughs> yeah. Need a little piece of meat. 
Well, I could definitely, I could eat this. Yeah. I don't think there's any limit. It just tastes like a fish head smells. I definitely can pick up the texture of the eyeballs. Does it taste any better? Because they, they're like a, I don't know what they're like. There you go. We ate the fish heads. You happy now? 